why did I become a revolutionary is a difficult question to answer because I was just a regular white South African. I grew up with no political ideas at all. And when I left school at the age of 18, when I matriculated, I had no idea what was going on in my own country. I virtually didn't even know the word apartheid. I knew nothing about politics, about the situation in this country. And in fact, to find out what was going on, I had to leave the country. We flew to London and simply walked into the ANC's office and said, we've come here to, to find out more about the ANC. The ANC sought to liberate the people of South Africa, uh, but of course at that time, uh, people were terrified of even mentioning the African National Congress. There were two young guys, Tim and Steve Lee, his chum, who were keen to do work, meaning secret work. And he had immediately sent them to some cafe around the corner. But of course, one was very wary. These could be the real McCoy, but they could be agents. Their response was a little bit of a shock to us. They kind of said, you can't walk in here like this and just ask that. Please meet us around the corner and we'll discuss it. In other words, <laughs> you've got to watch your tail. So it's a question then of chatting and their background and they have formed quite a good impression. They seem genuine, but you can never be sure. And when they said, we'll give you training and all the things that are required for underground work, it sounded very exciting. If there were people in our country who happened to be white, who wanted to play a role in the struggle, they were most welcome. They taught us how to operate secretly and securely in South Africa in a kind of police state. You know, they weren't the usual kind of intellectual types that one came across as students. They showed quite an ability to catch on to aspects of using gadgets, the kind of gadgets we had developed for playing street broadcasting messages or leaflet bombs, making timing devices. And the person who was so adept at that was Tim. He was brilliant, and I began to realise that he was a wonderful mix of somebody with a brain, but he had a uh, ability to construct things. He was a lovable guy and very, very quiet, almost withdrawn, which is what you want. sent back into South Africa with quite a lot of money and the instruction was to rent a premises, to set up a propaganda shop. Our political ideology had changed quite a lot and we felt very sympathetic towards the ANC. What we did was produce thousands of these propaganda leaflets and spend the whole night posting them all around Cape Town in different letterboxes. Very often with people we trained, it would take a year or more before they really became active. With these two guys, it happened very quickly and very successfully. While in Britain, we've been shown how to make a device called a leaflet bomb, which was really just a small explosive device with a timer, which was designed to throw leaflets up into the air. Our object was really just to kind of waken up people. To say, the ANC is active, it's alive, 
and Mr. Ostrago and Miss work together. We are coming to help you. They began to place them all around Cape Town. Tim Jenkins has the record of something like 18 or 19 leaflet bombs in the city centre and around in one day. And even when an action was carried out and maybe people were talking about it, I obviously couldn't say, oh, well, I did that or I really agree with that. You actually had to take up the opposite point of view and say, oh, these bloody terrorists, look what they're doing. I used to love blowing parlons up. In, that's in the 60s. And I, I, I always, anywhere in the world, I look at a pardon with a different way. And I size it up the way maybe a guy sizes up a woman, you know. I'd size up a pardon, <laughs> how I'd bring it down. It was actually a very, very lonely experience because there was no one you could talk to. I couldn't talk to my parents or my brothers and sisters or my friends or my girlfriend, anybody. You would spend hours often right through the night printing leaflets on our machines and addressing envelopes and licking stamps and licking envelopes and then going to post these things and spending hours and hours and hours making leaflet bombs. Also, having no connection with your handlers, we were representing the ANC, but we had no connection with them whatsoever, really. There was no ANC presence in the country, you know, there's no one we could connect up with. So in a sense, we felt like we were just doing our own thing. And this, as I said, is where mistakes often came in. <laughs> It was a big shock. They lasted two years, they were arrested. They moved in at the absolute worst moment for us. We were busy moving from one premises to another, so they found everything, got everything. They had all the remnants of all the leaflet bombs, which they were able to pin on us because they found a whole lot of unmade leaflet bombs that looked exactly the same. Basically, they had everything, and there it was in the front of the court. I had planned, even before getting to prison, that we were going to escape. During the day, uh, we worked in a, in a carpentry workshop. So I had this idea that maybe we could make a key out of uh, wood. The lateral thinking of this guy was such that he moved from trying to make metal keys into realising that with wooden doweling you make wooden keys so much more easy. So at night I studied this lock. Just by looking at it you can actually pick up most of the dimensions of the key. These three bits were cut in the workshop quite openly because they looked like nothing and of course they would never all three be kept together. So that part might be over there and that one over there and that one over there. So if the warden came along, it would look like nothing. And within a week I had a working key and I managed to get my inner door open. It took us a long time to actually figure out how to open the outer door because the keyhole was only on the outside. So you would thrust this through the window and then in order to see what you're doing, you'd hold this mirror outside the window, then you insert it in the keyhole and once it's in, simply crank. It didn't work the first time. It took almost a month before in fact, two months before we got this to work properly, so it was quite a mission. And then, amazingly, the escape took place, of which Tim was clearly an absolute, 
utter genius. We decided that the best thing would be to uh, just make keys for everything. It was not only doors that we opened, every single cupboard and every single locker and every tool chest that we were faced with, we made keys for. In fact, we had more keys than they did in the end. We'd left virtually no trace of how we'd got out. To get from our cells to the front door required 10 separate keys. We walked out into the bright sunlight and with each step we just grew more and more confident that we'd done it, that we were out. For me it was really just a release from the, the year and a half of extreme tension. You cannot believe the kind of tension that we were living under. The fear of being found with all these keys, with all this equipment, the fear of being caught. I even said to the others, I think we're invisible, I think we're invisible. Our route took us through Tanzania and ultimately to London. And once we were in the hands of the ANC, we felt safe. And my job was to train the increasing number of militants who were leaving the country and who wanted to go back to South Africa to do something, more or less in the same way that I did myself taught them how to make sure that no one was following them, how to ensure their security. How to conduct secret communications and how to conduct themselves in the underground. I remember in the 1980s, I was a journalist living in London in those days, but I used to travel a lot in Africa. I used to go to Harare and Lusaka and so on, and I would meet ANC people there, and they were a pretty unhappy lot, I would say, because, you know, they, they were in exile. Um, some of them were really homesick. Um, they didn't have much money, for the most part. Um, they were, of course, constantly under threat. Uh, people were under threat of murder by government get death squads or whatever. It did happen to a number of people, parcel bombs, that kind of stuff. I'd been in the struggle uh, in its illegal phase from the 60s, had been detained, had been uh, tortured, had been sent to prison, uh, and had come out of prison. Quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, being in the liberation struggle in the mid-80s mid left you with a view, a worldview that said you would not live to see freedom. But it was necessary that you did what you had to do. And then it was also a highly factionalised organisation, so the atmosphere was often paranoid. Um, it wasn't, wasn't really a happy, a happy time. I don't need to go into the fierce arguments that took place. At times, people wouldn't speak to each other for several days, and then they were comrades again. But what was missing was that we still relied on middle-level cadres to establish the political or the military uh, structures back home. They didn't have the stature of a leader that people would really listen to um, and, and carry out the instructions. They would need people on the ground in South Africa in touch with the leadership in Lusaka and London and various other places abroad um, in order to start an insurrection which would eventually turn into a people's war. It became people's war in that sense because in the ANC, we did not conceive of liberation as coming out of the barrel of the gun of the people who were trained abroad, who were going to shoot their way through to the union buildings. We wanted the people themselves to be able to respond to 
the violence that the enemy unleashed against them and wanted to train as many people as we could because it is in that way multiplying the forces of the, of the revolution. The security police and the apartheid intelligence services knew that this was the strategy, they were well informed, and obviously it was absolutely crucial to prevent the ANC from bringing in weapons and from bringing in the type of trained people who would be able to organize local resistance to the apartheid state. By 1986, 87, when we're talking about coming in, more than 40 people had been killed in detention, reported to be suicides, but we know killed under torture. And that's besides the thousands of others who were being detained in the country. So you were carrying out activity in the conditions of illegality in the face of a brutal state and in the face of that state out to smash and destroy the ANC. The mission given to the, the unit of which I was a member, K-43, was the capture of the chief of staff of Mkonto Sizwe, who at the time happened to be Joe Slavo. And in the, uh, the surveillance activities that we initiated, we determined, of course, that one of the main centres of operational activity for the, for the ANC MK was in fact London. So a lot of our surveillance activities took place in London. We created a very sophisticated close and surveillance capability. We knew that the, the postal system was inherently insecure. Practically every letter sent abroad or even internally was monitored in some way by the police. Picking up a phone is dangerous. I mean, what are you going to say? The code system to be of any sense has to be utterly simplistic. Because we were doing all the interceptions, I, to this day, to this day, I don't use a telephone. To this day, I do not have a telephone next to my bed. I do not have a telephone in the same room as me, especially nowadays with modern technology where there's a GPS inside your telephone. They tell you exactly where you are. I was called down to Lusaka uh, sometime in the mid 80s. I was sent down to train people in the use of some radio equipment. And uh, I met up with Mac Maharaj, and he said to me, I've heard that you guys have been experimenting with um, computer communication. Uh, we're very interested. When I met Tim, I found here was a chap who was approaching problems basically from the needs of the KDA inside the country, in the danger zone. And that is what made us work together. He was the first ANC leadership figure who considered the importance of communication. To run a struggle by remote control, you need to be fully in communication with the operatives, wherever they are. Operatives had exactly the same problems that we all had in covert operations, that is communication with people in the field. That's, that's the, the technical problem to crack. And uh, with the technical problem comes the morale and management problem. How do you keep your people motivated when they're living at the sharp edge under very dangerous conditions and you know, your, your leaders are swanning it around you know, another part of the world, you know, living a, a kind of champagne lifestyle, okay? So, so morale is always a very, very important issue under these circumstances. But, but the bottom line is you have to communicate. And you have to communicate not just, oh, hello, I'm okay. You have to communicate operational information that is significant. You could not use the hand and ciphering and deciphering methods if a one paragraph communication was going to take you 24 hours. And if you were deciphering, you would be sitting in a hideout taking 48 hours to decipher it. It was just impractical. By the mid-1980s, personal computers were becoming available. You could simply go to the high street and buy something that was quite respectable. By today's standards, they are absolutely nothing. We cannot believe how weak these computers were. They had a memory of 32 to 64 kilobytes, which is just absolutely laughable these days. But nonetheless, they were programmable, so we could learn how to simulate the basic encryption process. And 
Up until then, I'd been doing encryption in a manual way. Tim gave me a copy of the disk which had the encryption program on it. So encrypting using a computer program is a serious joy, not having to do this painstaking process of encrypting manually. Now the next stage was to get the computers to communicate with each other and we started to investigate other uh, methods using telephone touch tone tones. Then you could simply put those tones onto a tape or even play them down a telephone to someone at the far end who could be recording them onto a tape recorder. And then takes that tape recorder home, plays those tones back into this little device that then shows you the numbers. It worked, and it was only later that Mac came to visit me in London and told me about a secret project that was being planned. Even some of the main leadership of the ANC never knew about this project. I'd been called to Lusaka. Uh, to, to be briefed by the president of the ANC that there is this mission that they wanted me to be part of, of a leadership corps uh, inside South Africa, uh, and that I would be working with Joe Slovo. Joe Slovo would be giving me the details of what the mission entailed. That's the beginning for me of Operation Vula. This is not your run of the mill operation. This is going to be the installation of a senior leadership in the country that would then take over the, the command of underground work and link with the above ground and give leadership all round. So it's really at the level of Tambo and Slovo outside and a need to know with others. So Tim Jenkin from London comes to know. Or Connie Brom, who did very good support work, is linked in that way. It was a morning in March uh, 1986 that I got a phone call from Mac Maharai and uh, he phoned and he asked if, I, if he could see me and uh, to discuss something. She was the president of the Dutch anti-apartheid movement and she had been asked by those people who were involved in Operation Fuller uh, because she had a network of people who could assist. I had to set out to find people who you know, possibly could immigrate to South Africa who were willing, I mean, think of it, willing to give up everything, their job, lie to their friends, to their families. It was very, very clear that it, it was not without danger. The evening Connie asked me, I was very excited. For me, it was like, this is the thing, this is, doing more the thing I wanted to. I had a cover story for people in Holland. Uh, I was teaching at a school in Osaka. So all the letters I wrote, I mean, they, they, they were made up. She was stuck there in the outskirts of Lusaka in an incredible small house. You felt, you know, not, I didn't feel very safe there. I was asked to come to London, and there was Tim, whom I thought, oh my God, Woody Allen. This was the first thing I thought. And, and, it, um, and he was very sort of polite, took me to a room where I was sort of a normal, but I remember more than one computer. 
doubt if I've ever seen a computer. I mean, it's and you can't imagine it now, but in 86, I mean, people didn't have computers. Our equipment on the London side had been ready for months and it was standing there. Even though we tested it many times between Lusaka and London, we knew that the system worked. But we couldn't really believe that it was actually going to be used. We just thought it's too sophisticated, it's too complex. When we were preparing you know, for the communication system, the, the most difficult question of all came, can you find a person who, you know, uh, will, can go sort of three, four times per month, you know, Amsterdam, Johannesburg. Now imagine that besides the cost. Um, it's to find, it's, that had to be a businessman or something, and that's not a, And, oh God, that gave me such headaches. Till, you know, this one moment, I wasn't thinking of it, you know, and all of a sudden I knew, an air hostess. It had to be an air hostess. <laughs> I was quite excited. It was a kind of an adventure. And, um, well, I didn't see the dangers that, that, at that time. So I felt honored that, you know, people whom I, I like very much and that they trust me. I immediately laughed her. I mean, she's the most wonderful uh, person and a very, very uh, experienced air hostess. And I remember, God, I drank a whole bottle of wine with her, but I was not used to it. And, uh, but it was great, and then she started. It's a kind of a mindset. When you are going and smuggle something, you have to forget what you're doing. So you have to act. Secondly, it's like I'm in a group. Crew coming to Schiphol Airport did not have to go through an X-ray screening machine. They were allowed a special entry, and when they returned, similarly. We found that in Johannesburg Airport, that time known as Jan Smuts Airport, as a turnaround crew, they did not have to go through the searches. I had to open a bank account, uh, a safe deposit. Uh, you know, they sent me to do things like that. Coming through the uh, immigration and customs, there's this huge apprehension in advance. I couldn't do it without having a stiff drink on the plane beforehand to calm myself. I, I found myself getting very tense. And when I'm very tense, I tend to shake quite a bit. And when you were through, you weren't sure that maybe they were onto you because you were there still, you know, in their environment. It was actually quite nerve-wracking. The Secret Forces knew exactly who was who. So they had to be disguised. And this was not, you know, easy thing of putting on a moustache or something like that. This was serious, very professional disguises. As much as we had a lot of respect for Ronnie Cashels, Ronnie took himself very, very seriously. Uh, he called himself the Scarlet Pimpernel. We call him the Scarlet Pumpkin, OK? <laughs> we didn't always have the highest of respect uh, uh, for his somewhat flamboyant attempts at, at bamboozling the other side. You're dealing with sophisticated people here. With the contact lenses, I tried them. I saw dentists there, or people who dealt with dentures, so that I could change my look. I had more than one disguise, green contact lenses, and then I had blonde hair. And then every day I used to have to put on makeup, which was this major issue. Janet Hui, you know, her disguise was Lady Di. Wow, she was so beautiful. <laughs> and, but she had to learn to walk on high heels because she was a really well-trained MK person, eh? Who <laughs> walked gang, gada gang, gada gang, and she had to be, you know, trained, I think, with an actress. Mac and I were so high profile uh, that we could not take the chance of using the South African border posts. And when we got off the aircraft in Swaziland, the Swazi security police were there, and I knew them, but they didn't recognize me. 
because of the disguise that I had. If if I just come in uh, as I was, they would certainly have locked me up and sent me back to Lusaka or wherever. Uh, we had got into Swaziland clandestinely. We're now living in a hideout. Whilst we're busy trying to check which best route to, to use, the people that we're going to pick Mac up got arrested, which therefore meant that we needed to act and act quickly. My quick reaction was it means we need to abort the, the infiltration. And Mac, being Mac, said it means we do it now. So we crossed in front daylight and we crossed with concealed arms. We needed to make sure that as they walk through the rural area, they should look like farm workers. So we got overalls for them. Then she took us to a homestead where we stayed. She went to check out the, the crossing point, came back when all was clear and she just took us to the crossing point. We were now entering the country with false papers, with legends as to who we were. Do not, don't do that anymore. Until such time that you know that people are safely at home, the job has not ended. So it was a huge tension because up to going to bed that night, we didn't know if they had arrived safely. So the relief for me was the next day when Ivan came to okay. tell me that the trip was actually a safe trip. And of course, when we crossed, I kneeled and kissed the soil. came in, we had to start the communication system. We then developed an outfit on the ground. The second person to draw in was Janet Laub. It had been agreed that I could look towards renting accommodation. And I saw an advert on this board saying, uh, accommodation for rent, owner almost never there. And it was like, that's exactly what I need. And I spoke to this guy on the phone, his name was Reggie, and he then asked one of those seriously obvious questions, what's your name? And I remember saying, my name, my name, like a complete, you know, somebody was really not particularly with the program. And I looked around me and there was an underwear shop called Kathy. I said, Oh, my name is Kathy. And it was the one name that stuck with me more than any of the others. So it came from an underwear shop. Yeah. It was a very strange life, you know. It was, you were leading this double life. And even with my own partner, I mean, she knew that I was up to something, but I couldn't really tell her exactly what it was. He came, I think, once every three weeks to Amsterdam to bring me a parcel or a book. I don't know, there's something. It was always a little bit different, but never big packets. Very shy, didn't talk too much. He was very determined. He knew what he was doing. She made several trips before her meetings with uh, that person in the hotel, in the darkened hotel room. Antoinette's contact point was in the bookshop in the hotel. So she collected that message, found the room, and came over to that room. And there was the man sitting, the goods were closed or half closed, and, um, and he was obviously happy to see me with my packet at the right time and uh, the right moment. She was the one that came in with the initial communications pack. A laptop, the early generation of the Toshiba laptops, 
and uh, she brought in the discs. After we sent in the first computer, we expected things to start immediately, but it actually took a couple of weeks. And then suddenly one day, I was sitting at my desk and the telephone answering machine suddenly started whirring. And I thought, no, this must be perhaps a wrong number or something. But then sure enough, I heard the distinctive tones of the messages and I could hear this thing coming through. The tape word and word and word, and then it stopped and I loaded the message onto my computer. In fact, it was a report from Mac. And sure enough, there was our first message, absolutely perfect. I mean, because of the advanced nature of the equipment and the methods we were using, only few people had access to the communication system. And I think that was infiltration proof. It was absolutely safe. That was one of the big, big advantages of Operation Fuller, that it could communicate in such a safe way, and such a, a quick way. I mean, you didn't need a courier, you know, going through all the danger and hassles of, of bringing a message from A to Z. You had almost a direct line. Practically every day we received a message and then it stepped up until we were just receiving a constant stream of these messages all day long, even at night. So that machine was just constantly clicking on and off, day in and day out. For me, it was a revelation. We had codes for people, for things, for cities, for, for events. But basically, you wrote what you wanted to write, and then encrypt the, the message and transmit it to Tim. London was, in a sense, a kind of collecting point for all the information. And we didn't want people communicating randomly with each other. So everything had to be filtered through London. Sometimes we would dial up and, you know, it would fall and we'd dial up again and it'd fall. And then eventually you'd hear this, it's a special noise that you hear. It's a kind of um, a, a, a ringing hum that you, can, you know that the data is being transmitted. And then you'd still have to wait to be sure that you received your, your message on your pager, that it had all gone through. Otherwise, you'd have to do it all over again. So, you know, transmitting a message could take anything from three quarters of an hour to two and a half hours. We would communicate inside the country with Mac, with Janet Love, with Ronnie Castles, with all the people who were participating in the, in the mission. And Tim would write back to me, and I would receive this gibberish on the phone. Just sounds. And I would record uh, the gibberish. I'd go to my computer, just to say decipher. We proposed that we would transmit from public phones, and that had a great advantage because you could go to different phones. You never created a, a pattern to your work. The problem that arose was that when we put the money in to transmit to London, you had to put coins all the time. And each time you put the coin in, and when it dropped, it interrupted and corrupted that portion of the message. By sheer accident, we discovered that Telcom had introduced phone cards. And so we got hold of phone cards, and that solved the problem. That is when the system began to sing. In a sense, I had a grandstand view in uh, London because I was seeing everything. The comrades in South Africa would be writing reports about the situation the, uh, on the ground in the country. So there was almost real-time connection between London and Lusaka. So I knew about all these diverse operations. I knew the requirements, the dangers, the plans that people made for smuggling weapons and 
people into the country, essentially even the passwords and the keywords and everything that people were using. This was quite simply the worst. Oh, gee, guys. Hang on, gee, guys. You have the situation at home if we now talk about the mid-80s towards 1980, 89 and 90. Uh, Galvanised masses at home, the UDF particularly, and the trade union movement and, and all the structures. Um, it's a tremendous move towards revolutionary conditions. Our mandate had not been to make contact with Mandela. But reading the situation in the country, sent a report to, to Tambo and Slovo to say, look, chaps, uh, this phase is a very tough one. Uh, and there's too much room for damage. Uh, in my assessment, it is imperative we open communications with Mandela. We'd already looked into the problem of Mandela's circumstances at Victor Fester. He was at that time receiving visitors from his lawyers, from Winnie and family. Mac Maharaja's linking with that very lawyer, and he sees the possibilities, a, a fantastic insight and uh, understanding. Tambo's reaction was extremely cautious. Uh, and he actually said, no, no, no. Explain to me exactly how you're going to do it, because I think this is high risk. You're going to jeopardize your long-term mission, and uh, whatever other problems may have, we'll have to find a way to manage. And uh, I ignored that message. What I did is to write a, a message, made it into a little tiny roll, gave it to his lawyers, and said, look, guys, you're going to be extremely nervous with this thing. And we don't know how Mandela is going to re react. The regime people, they think that they've got Mandela nicely isolated in prison and they're talking to him, that he's got no outlet and no one to report to or to receive counter instructions to. We had assumed that the place is bugged and we knew that the point at which the meetings took place was over the dining room table. And while talking, under the table, he had to pass this little note. Mandela seems to have clicked, he collected it, but apparently kept missing his pocket under the table. Eventually put it, and the joke we have is that he went to the toilet at least four times. Because it was such fine print, handwritten, that he went to read the message and absorb it. But it was to tell him that now, A, it's from me, B, I can put, we can put him in direct touch with Tambo. We have a safe means of communication. It was possible for, for Mandela to immediately communicate anything and everything with Oliver Tambo. I was on the inside and I was, I was transmitting these things. When I was retyping the handwritten notes of Madiba, the reality of that just, just was so incredibly strong. There was no warning that th this kind of a message was about to come. I couldn't believe my eyes. They stood out in stalks when I saw that this was actually a report from Nelson Mandela here on my computer for the first time on any computer in the entire world. I've got a report from Nelson Mandela. Well, I just immediately enciphered it and handed it on to the appropriate party. I mean, for me, that was almost not the ultimate aim, but one of the ultimate aims of a Vula. That level of high level political contact of people inside and outside the country. I felt really incredibly strengthened. I felt a sense of excitement. I s felt a sense of um, probably headiness and, and almost victory that, that, that had, a long way, had a long way to go. The reality was that the system was working in such a way that from the time the message reached me, Oliver Tambo could have it 
anywhere in the world within a matter of hours. This was a time when um, the regime was speaking to Mandela and they thought that they were talking just to an individual, whereas in fact Nelson Mandela was really talking on behalf of the ANC. So it wasn't his private personal point of view that he was telling them, he was expressing the party line, so to speak. But you can imagine that without this communication system, the apartheid regime was sitting on an issue where it could have divided the movement into fragments and set us at war with each other. Mandela would have been seen as a sellout and we would have had bedlam in the, in the struggle ranks. Mandela is out, read all about it, Mandela is out. I remember when it happened, I was with, with uh, Janet Love and Ronnie Castro were in a flat in, in Johannesburg. And uh, you, we toasted to, to that release. Most of us didn't really trust what was happening. We just thought this was a ruse to kind of get us all back into South Africa and then they would just all arrest us. So we continued to develop Vula, to expand throughout the country. The movement of arms continued because we needed to be prepared in case this whole thing turned sour. There was a war being waged against the ANC with the IFP and police and military elements. So we needed to continue to bring weapons in. The dominant theme had become negotiation, but negotiations had not taken off. We were still on an egg dance. People who had been part of the leadership were now officially part of the negotiations, but were also being very closely watched. And so the need to liaise with leadership was very, very difficult, and that couldn't have been done without the communication network kicking into action. We had to carry the underground into the negotiation posture. We had to convince the underground, not by orders, but by political discussion, that this was the phase we're in, this is the role that we are playing, and we have to adjust our tactics according to the development. This is a new democratic bedeling for South Africa and all its people. It was all up for the regime. The leadership of the ANC was already inside the country. And so I think there was a, an element of, of relaxation on our part. The police decided that they were going to follow me. I had a tail and I had a, a, a car that would not outrace them. When Vula was discovered, it was a great embarrassment to the ANC, and I've seen from some ANC internal documents, it really set them on the back foot. I remember the absolute feeling of shock. Panicky as well. Panicky for the comrades out in the field. I was sitting with Totsi in this house, of a Vula underground house in Harare, and Ivan came in. And he said, Mac has been arrested. Mac has been arrested. And then we thought, but well, now a raid is coming. And then you start to listen. If, are they coming? This situation that you've heard about, that you've helped people to prepare for, that, you know, this is now a death squad coming, you know, these guys with guns and who will kill you. I have to say that my reaction was but, you know, probably a little, um, well, was described to me as being a little callous because I was really very concerned about where the discs were. They found at one of the hideouts a set of discs where the previous transactions and communications had been deciphered but not re-enciphered. And so the raw information was sitting there.
They found the encryption disks, they found the code books, they found a lot of the plane messages, and with what they found, they were able to unravel the entire thing. So suddenly, out of the blue, you now get a blip on a radar screen that is a lot more sophisticated, makes use of encrypted communications, computer communications, etc. Then you start looking at the people involved. Well, these are, you know, these are high-caliber people as well. So this is something out of the ordinary. It's not just the, the average run-of-the-mill stuff. This was July 1990. There was talks taking place between the National Party and the ANC, so they came pretty close to panic when they discovered this underground operation. Mac Maharaj was arrested and I think was furious that the ANC didn't do more to support him. Many people in the ANC didn't know about Vula and the discovery that there was this, what appeared to be this duplicitous strategy embarrassed them very much, but eventually they were able to regain the initiative. I mean, I, I, I lead sort of, I suppose, pretty much a normal life, but there's a lot that's still there. I mean, um, yeah, you carry it, you carry it, so, yeah. So where do I fit into this thing? I don't know. I know that when I decided to retire, resign, retire from active politics in 99. I owed a huge debt to my children and my family. But I've come to realize now that it is not a debt that can be redeemed by any action that I take now, because the scars that were inflicted then will remain forever. Sometimes we forget the millions that we said we were fighting for because that was the drive. We, we were never doing the things that we were doing for us as individuals. We were doing them because we wanted to make a difference to broader South Africa. And it becomes sad when you see that we're just not quite getting there. I've seen from the inside how information can be controlled. And I'm talking here from the inside being Minister in charge of intelligence. No secrets. No lies. No more power. It's an unusual country. Yeah. I've had a very tough time when it was all over. I closed myself off. Every time when there was something on the news about South Africa, I would just not listen. I think it is a, a few months ago. All of a sudden, I don't know, there must have been, must have been a reason that I thought, okay, now it's enough, Connie, you know? It's like a sort of a divorce, and, uh, and now, you know, you, you, you're capable of, you know, seeing your ex-lover again. Without that experience, I wouldn't be here. I would, I might have been a, a mother in Holland or what, I don't know. My life probably would have looked completely different. Uh, I, I survived to see the democracy. I, I, I try to integrate that past. I try to link my present with, with, with that past. I've told my children about what I did, but I don't think they really understand. They've grown up with modern computers, so they, they can't really contemplate a world without the internet. 
But they know that their father was slightly different, your average father. Know more about your world. ENCA.com